Okay, everyone, I'm hoping you can see me, invite people, live me. Um, so I want to kind of get things going and start the review. I got a bunch of information, um, questions that you guys have sent me. Yay! Just want to make sure that you could see me. Um, my volume is turned off, but hopefully you can hear me because according to everything you can. Oh. So yay, you can hear me. Um, so we're going to get going. Um, I will get the chat, chat popped up um, in case you guys want to ask me so in this um so let me go to my youtube uh, some about the um supreme court cases and like presidential actions things like that um in case there was an essay and i had mentioned that you do not need to memorize every little thing and every little detail you should kind of know the big um impacts so like for example supreme court cases i would know why they're important the six that are going to be on the midterm so marbury versus madison mcculloch versus maryland uh gibson versus ogden worchester versus georgia plessy versus ferguson and dred scott versus sanford you should know why each of those is important like what was the decision but you should know two of them in depth Here's my chat. Yay, group chat. So if you know two of those in depth really well, like what's the historical background of the case? Why did, is this case happening? What was the Supreme Court decision? And what was the impact you'd be set for a essay on that? Uh, same thing with presidential actions. Um, you know, you should know two really, really well. So um, Lincoln Emancipation Proclamation or suspension of habeas corpus would be two good ones. Uh, Jackson, Indian removal, you could do Jefferson, Louisiana purchase. All those would be really good. Um, so otherwise, I'm going to start going with the questions that you have submitted to me. Um, and hopefully um, I can answer those questions for you and you guys can be set. So um, the Constitution. Um, I have a whole video on the Constitution. I can post it in the comments here when I post this video. So I'm not going to go super detailed, but you should know the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. Um, any law that is contradictory to the Constitution is deemed unconstitutional. And that was set up um, through that process of judicial review, which was um, clarified by Marbury versus, Marbury versus Madison. Um, when it comes to the constitution, this was created at the constitutional convention in response to the weaknesses of the articles of confederation. The articles of confederation was our first plan of government. It's extremely weak. Uh, there's one branch of government, the legislative branch, and they're really ineffective and couldn't really pass any legislation or make any amendments. So the constitutional convention is held to create a new plan for government. Um, with this, they practice the idea of federalism, where they're going to split the powers between the state and federal government. So this is where you see concurrent, delegated, and reserved powers come into play. So federalism is a separation of powers between the state and federal government. So we talk about delegated powers. These are powers delegated or given to the federal government. Um, so this could be set in like a national tariff, um, the power to coin money, um, to maintain um, armed forces, to declare war. Um, all of those are examples of delegated powers. These are powers only the federal government has. Powers reserved to the state are powers that only states have. Um, so they are the ones who control and run public elections. They are the ones who um, will 
create local governments for towns. They are the ones who make marriage laws and the concurrent powers. Concurrent powers are shared powers. These are powers that both the states and federal governments have. So the power to borrow money or the power to collect taxes. Um, and those are ones that they tend to share the most. Um, I wouldn't memorize every delegated reserved or concurrent power, but you should recognize that both state and federal governments can collect taxes. Only the federal government can coin money or declare war. Um, and then like elections and marriage laws are run by the state. Um, so I say like, you know, marriage laws are run by the state, which is why for some people um, having a federal law that protects same-sex marriages was controversial because people felt that that was a federal government infringing upon states' powers. So that, that was um, uh, something that was controversial. So other issues with the Constitution, you should make no, uh, make sure you know that the Constitution really was a, this bundle of compromises. You have a number of deals made at the Constitutional Convention, largely about representation. So the Great Compromise, where small states and big states really um, come together and agree that there's going to be a bicameral legislature or two houses of the government. The House of Representatives will be based on population, which makes the big states happy. And then the Senate, every state gets two, which makes the little states happy. Um, you also had the Three-Fifths Compromise, where each slave was classified as three-fifths a person um, for both representation and taxation. Um, and then of course they come up with the electoral college to elect the president. I'll post the video that's really detailed on the constitution for you guys and you can check it out. Um, but definitely make sure you know that the constitutional convention was a, you know, a bundle of compromises. The great compromise is really big. Um, also keep in mind that there's a big debate over whether or not to ratify or approve the constitution. Federalists believe that the strong federal government was needed and it was fine. But anti-federalists refused to support the Constitution unless a Bill of Rights was added to protect the rights of the people. So the first 10 amendments to the Constitution really focuses on um, these Bill of Rights that outline our rights, such as freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of press, the right to bear arms, etc. So that was something that was really key. Okay, let me see any other... Um, um, no. Okay. Just want to make sure I didn't miss anything on the constitution. Again, I'm going to post my constitution video that you can review. Um, you know, it's always good to know the constitution because that's going to come up a lot throughout the course, especially when we look at like Supreme court cases and powers between state and federal governments. Um, as far as knowing which presidents are elected in which years, it's more important to know, approximately like when they were um, you don't have to memorize each election year there are a couple that come up that are really important to know uh, just because they're like a turning point so like the election of 1860 is the year that Abraham Lincoln is elected to the presidency and then this marks the south seceding from the nation because of their concerns that he might um, impact the, uh, their ability to have slaves or also infringe upon their state sovereignty or rights. Uh, the other one, the other presidential election that you should know is the election of 1876. So this is post-Civil War, it's during Reconstruction. And what we see is that um, Republican Hayes, a Democrat Tilden, um, kind of split the electoral vote. There's a few states that are contested. There's not a clear winner. And ultimately this will end with the compromise of 1877. So the election of 1876 leads to kind of like the standoff between Republicans and Democrats, who's gonna win the compromise of 1877. The Democrats are willing to give the presidency to Hayes in exchange for reconstruction coming to an end. So that would mean reconstruction ends, um, military districts in the South will be dissolved, troops will be removed from the South, and then this would then allow the South to continue to 
um, implement Jim Crow legislation that would then restrict the civil rights of uh, newly freed African Americans. Um, and then this is what kind of paves the way to the South being known um, as like the solid South because they solidly voted for the Democrats. Um, that brings me to uh, this idea of like, why was the Republican Party formed and why was the Democratic Party formed? So the Democratic Party kind of starts with Thomas Jefferson. They're known as Democratic Republicans. Um, they believe in rule by the people. They believe in strong state governments. They really emphasize agriculture. They have very strict interpretation of the Constitution. Um, and they believe that states could have banks, but the national government shouldn't. And they want a free trade. Uh, these Democratic Republicans become known as Democrats uh, with Andrew Jackson. So Andrew Jackson, the you know, common man. We see Jacksonian democracy where there's universal male suffrage for white males in America. They no longer had to own property. So that's kind of where the Democratic Party emerges from. Now, the Republican Party starts um, with a push to prevent the expansion of slavery in new tarot. Um, Abraham Lincoln, you know, he was Republican. He didn't agree with slavery, but, you know, it was more about expanding slavery. They wanted to prevent that in the Western territories as they became states. They wanted to prevent the expansion of slavery, not only for like the civil rights aspect, but also to maintain that balance of power in Congress. If there's more slave states, that means slave states will have more power in Congress. They'll be able to pass more laws that would then support um, the Southern states. So in the North, the Republicans really want to prevent that. They want to make sure there was a balance of power or if there, it shifted at least the, the Northern um, politicians would have more power. Um, and then just to kind of jump off of that, I talked about Thomas Jefferson, you know, believing in strong state governments. He is an anti-federalist. Um, the big argument between him and Hamilton is that Hamilton really supported this idea that uh, the wealthy class should rule. He supported the idea of the electoral college. He was concerned um, the average American wasn't capable of, you know, education, like being educated in their, their voting. Um, he really focused on manufacturing. He believed in a loose interpretation of the constitution. He was supporters of the British. He supported the national bank. And that's one of the big issues with Jefferson and Hamilton is that under Hamilton's economic proposals, he's like, we need a national bank to manage all of our federal money. And it doesn't say in the constitution that you can make that, but he's like, well, there's the elastic clause that allows Congress to make any any law necessary and proper to help them carry out their duties. And if we need to maintain a national economy, then that would make sense that we would have a national bank. So he gets Congress to make a bill that would establish this national bank. And of course, Thomas Jefferson, who is against this and also a strict um, kind of like interpreter of the constitution was like, we can't do this, uh, which is part of the reason why Jefferson will, um, you know, uh, eliminate that when he comes into office. Uh, but those are some of the arguments that they had. Um, let's see. Um, and then this ties into the nullification crisis. So nullification means that like cancel out. And what we see is there's a number of federal laws that are passed where states and uh, Congress persons don't believe they're constitutional. You know, especially these strict constitutionalists are like, look, if it's not in there, we shouldn't be able to do this. And so there's a number of times where states attempt to nullify or cancel out federal laws. But as I've already said, the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. Uh, the Supreme Court has ruled numerous times that the federal government is supreme over states. So what the federal government says, states have to follow. And so the nullification crisis is, um, you know, a series of events where Southern states threaten to secede or break away from the nation, um, unless federal laws are nullified or removed. So, you know, when Abraham Lincoln is elected president, you know, it wasn't the first time Southern states had threatened to break away. It's just the first time they actually did it. Um, they had used that as like a bargaining chip or like a threat numerous times. 
Um, to build off of, of our talking about like nullification um, or the constitution, um, when we talk about the unwritten constitution, these are things not written down in the constitution. So these are policies or traditions not in the constitution at all, but something that we do. So good examples is the president's cabinet. There's nothing in the Constitution that creates a president's cabinet, but um, George Washington was like, I need advisors. I'm going to make a cabinet of advisors to advise me of important issues. And since then, the cabinet has continued as part of the unwritten Constitution. It's one of those precedents that Washington set, and it has continued to grow and develop over the years. Um, another um, unwritten Constitution uh, would be the two terms that... Washington held. So initially there wasn't an amendment that made the president limit themselves to two terms. George Washington did that. He was concerned that if he kept ruling that this might lead to, you know, some kind of like monarchy or dictatorship. And so he stepped down and then presidents continued to follow that policy of just two terms. And this doesn't change until Franklin Delano Roosevelt during the Great Depression and World War II gets elected to four terms. And then afterwards, there's an amendment that makes it law. You can't have more than two terms. Um, so those are kind of some of the big ones um, that that he does there. Um, so I just don't want to miss any of the questions that you guys had. Okay, so there's a question about the Judiciary Act of 1789 and why this was considered unconstitutional in the case Marbury versus Madison. So I, I've told you guys numerous times, like Marbury versus Madison can be a difficult case to remember well because there's a lot of um, terminology like midnight judges, etc. But the Judiciary Act basically was an act of Congress. So this is a, a law passed by Congress that gave the Supreme Court the power to essentially um, kind of force the hand of, of the government. So in this case, Marbury was um, appointed to be a judge. He was not given that appointment by the new president. And so the Judiciary Act would have allowed the Supreme Court to make Jefferson and make Madison give Marbury that job. However, the Supreme Court under Marshall, John Marshall was like, look, the Constitution outlines the powers of the Supreme Court. Congress cannot just make a law to give the Supreme Court more power. If they want to give the Supreme Court more power, they need to do a constitutional amendment. Therefore, the Judiciary Act is unconstitutional because it's given powers not in the Constitution. Uh, and then this is what kind of clarifies and establishes that idea of judicial review where the judicial branch reviews laws as to whether or not they are constitutional or unconstitutional. Uh, so um, another question that was given to me is what did the government agree to do with the South after the Civil War? So after the Civil War, there's a number of plans for reconstruction. So Abraham Lincoln and his vice president, um, Andrew Johnson, both believed in being forgiven and taking it easy on the South. They were like, we need to bind up our nation's wounds and move forward with malice towards none. So that was like Lincoln's second inaugural. He was like, you know, we need to forgive. We need to fix our problems. We need to move on. So both um, Johnson and Lincoln kind of believed in this idea that, you know, 10% of the South would take a, an oath, uh, swear an allegiance to the U.S., and we can kind of move things along. Um, unfortunately, Abraham Lincoln is assassinated and then Johnson becomes president. Johnson was a Southerner. He was a Democrat. And the radical Republicans who were staunch abolitionists had control of Congress and they wanted the South to pay. And when Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, it really kind of weakened the, you know, the incoming president. Uh, Johnson didn't have as much power or as much support. He didn't want to punish the South at all. And so this allowed the radical Republicans to essentially uh, push through their legislation 
um, and kind of force their radical Republican plans on the South. So um, if you're a former Confederate officer, you were you couldn't hold public office, you had to um, have new constitutions established for each state that would ban slavery. Uh, they passed the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. So, you know, they, they end slavery permanently with the 13th, then they give them citizenship with the 14th, and then the 15th Amendment gives um, African American males the right to vote. They also create what's called military reconstruction. So the South is divided into like five military districts where um, officers and soldiers from uh, the United States military would oversee the South to maintain order until they could be readmitted to the Union, readmitted to the United States. And of course, this continues uh, for a while. And during this time, you see um, a number of, of African American males be elected to office in the South once they had the right to vote. But with that election of 1876 and then the Compromise of 1877, uh, reconstruction comes to an end. People are tired of of dealing with the issues. They're still struggling economically. They're struggling to rebuild um, in the South, and they just want to move on. So reconstruction ends. The military districts are resolved. The states are reinstituted, and then what we see is those Jim Crow laws um, start to limit the new rights of um, freed African Americans, especially in the South. So. While they might have citizenship, it's going to be really limited. Um, even the right to vote is going to be limited by like poll taxes, literacy tests, et cetera. And then we enter into this phase where it's the solid South. You have a solid Democratic Party in the South. Um, you don't see blacks being elected to political office in the South anymore. Um, you have the rise of white supremacy groups such as like the KKK using terrorism and fear to prevent African Americans from voting. Um, and also from whites who might support them from trying to, to change those Jim Crow laws, which will exist until the civil rights movement into the 1950s and 60s. So that's going to continue for a while. Okay, let's go back to the questions. I think that's kind of the big questions that I had. Um, oh, the War of 1812. Okay. So the War of 1812 to some people is kind of considered the second war for independence. So this is a war between the United States and Great Britain, and it was kind of a long time coming. You know, we have George Washington trying to deal with these issues. Uh, the British are impressing U.S. sailors. So they're, they're capturing merchant ships that are from the U.S. They're forcing these sailors to then serve in the British military. The Jays Treaty is constructed under Washington's presidency to try to stop this and try to prevent some of these tensions that are holdovers from the American Revolution. Of course, people are upset by this, especially Thomas Jefferson, who was pro-French. And they're like, why are we making treaties with the British? We just got our independence from them. And then Washington leaves office and John Adams comes in. And we have the French are impressed on U.S. sailors as well because they're angry about the Jays Treaty and the fact that, you know, the U.S. isn't really backing them in these conflicts between France and Great Britain. And the French are like, we helped you get your independence. What gives, man? So uh, John Adams is trying to negotiate an end to the French impressment. And uh, some French agents say, give us $250,000 and we'll talk. To which... John Adams is like, no, not going to happen. And of course, this is known as the XYZ affair because Congress didn't believe this was the case. So he he gave them the evidence, but had the names blacked out and just wrote XYZ um, where the names of the, the French delegates were. Um, so what we see is that there's this continuation of tension, both with the French and the British in the U.S. Um, there, nothing's really resolved. You know, you have John Adams kind of try to clap back with the Aliens and Sedition Acts where he's really targeting French citizens. But of course, Jefferson doesn't like that. <clears throat> so Jefferson becomes president. There's still this tension. Sailors are still being impressed and nothing's really changing. So Jefferson tries that embargo of 1807 
trying to hurt the British economy, but this just sets the US into a recession because we're still developing and we're still kind of fragile. And this just kind of continues. And of course, we're trying to remain neutral because uh, Washington was like, hey, remain neutral, no permanent entangled alliances. We have to develop on our own. But there's just a lot of tension and things don't seem to be changing when um, Madison finally has to declare our first war. And this is the War of 1812. And again, we're fighting the British. Um, we have some new tech um, you know, as we're moving in towards the industrial phase. But it, it, there's, it, there's no real you know, clear victor here. Um, eventually, the Treaty of Ghent is signed that ends the war. Um, you know, the boundaries are just kind of returned to the way they were. Uh, the British are supposed to leave um, the territories um, that were part of the United States now. We have one major victory, woohoo, um, in the Battle of New Orleans, led by Andrew Jackson, who will become president. Uh, but this is unfortunately after the war ended because, of course, you know, it took time for news to travel. But what we do see is out of this War of 1812 is it kind of helps unite the United States for a while. You know, we had these issues with Federalists and Anti-Federalists that had developed into the Federalist Party and the Democratic Republicans, and they had been fighting. But now we have like a common enemy. So this ushers in this era of good feelings because America becomes like nationalistic. We unite. Uh, politically, things are pretty calm for a while. Um, we're showing the world once again that we can defend ourselves against a major world power such as Great Britain. And, and, and life is pretty good for a while. Um, but unfortunately, um, you know, that's really only going to last a little bit. And then we enter into that era of like sectionalism that then brings up more political issues as well. Um, and the Monroe Doctrine. So the Monroe Doctrine is this uh, major foreign policy that will be outlined by um, under Monroe's presidency. So what we saw in like the early 1800s is a number of revolutions take place in Latin America. So you probably remember that from like global or AP world. So you have like the Haitian revolution, then you have Latin American revolutions, and then uh, Brazil gains their independence from Portugal. And the United States is kind of recognizing this as a moment to remove permanently um, European powers from like the Western Hemisphere so that the U.S. can kind of establish themselves as kind of like the big dog on campus. So the Monroe Doctrine was utilized to kind of warn Europe to stay out of the Western Hemisphere. They're like, look, you stay out of the Western Hemisphere. You cannot colonize or recolonize any more of the territories here in the Western Hemisphere that's like North and South America. Um, and we vow not to get involved in your affairs in Europe. So you guys have the Eastern Hemisphere. We have the Western Hemisphere. We'll mind our business. You mind your business. And life is good. However, if you try to get involved in the Western Hemisphere, we're going to take that as a threat to our security um, and we'll take action. Um, and this will maintain, be maintained as like our major foreign policy for a while. Um, and when we do our imperialism unit, you'll see how we kind of expand upon that. But that was, you know, the gist of the Monroe Doctrine. So, you know, usually you're asked about, you know, what was its goals? And that's essentially to keep Europe out of the Western Hemisphere um, and, and prevent further recolonization. Okay, so I'm just double checking to make sure I didn't miss anything. Um, okay, so it doesn't look like I missed anything. Um, so a couple of reminders for the test. Um, you have your 50 multiple choice. You should be bringing a number two pencil so that you can use the Scantron. And then you have your two essays, which will be an essay book, um, and that should be in pen. The thematic essay and then a DBQ. I remind you to use the test to take the test. When you're doing your essays, go back to the multiple choice and look for multiple choice that can help you with your essays. Um, that being said, I have a number of videos that you can access. There's tons of review in Google Classroom as well. Um, I'm going to post this video and I'll post the Constitution video I've done before in here as well. And then you can kind of go back and rewatch it. Okay, so I will see you guys tomorrow. Um, 
if you know you're studying and you come up with anything, you can always shoot me an email and I'll try to respond tomorrow for the test. Um, the rest of the essays are going to be getting returned within the next like hour or so. So I think I have like five left if you haven't gotten your essay back. Um, the main takeaways though is make sure when you're doing those essays, do all the tasks. So one of the things I'm noticing with these thematics I'm grading is it's asking for the historical context. So like why did that president make that decision? Like what's going on in the U S that made that president make that decision. So if you had like a Supreme court case essay and it says, what's the historical context? That's okay. So if you're doing, um, Dred Scott versus Sanford historical context, you have to talk about, you know, these issues between pro slave and anti-slavery states, this attempt to balance the power, um, as we expand West and how this leads to a greater discussion of, you know, the rights of, of slaves in a free, if they're taken to a free state, are they citizens, et cetera. So you have to really talk about like what's going on in the country. Um, so if it says historical context, like set it up, what's going on in our country that leads to whatever it is you're talking about. And then the impact, um, some of you have done a really good job of like the historical context and then the impacts like a sentence long, like, oh, it had positive impacts. Okay. But what are those impacts? Like if you're spending a paragraph on historical context, you should have a paragraph on the impacts. Okay. Try to be specific. That's where using the multiple choice comes in handy. If you can't remember things, go back and look at them. Um, you know, make sure you have an introduction, your body's conclusion with the DBQ. Don't get sucked into the documents and forget outside information. You need outside info. So a way you can avoid that is uh, brainstorm whatever you know about the topics before you look at the documents. Or another way you can do it is for every document that you're going to use, identify at least one piece of outside information that helps you. And outside information is anything not in the document. So you can go back to the multiple choice and find information and that's outside information. Or you can remember things from like your class and it's up in your head, that's outside information, okay? So um, make sure you're, you're being smart about that. Um, you know, if you give a document, analyze and connect it to your claim and, you know, add in some outside info. And if you do that each time, like you're gonna have a solid, solid essay. Um, it is three hours. You have to save for at least two. I'm going to tell you now, though, use the time. People who leave at two hours typically are not doing the best they can. They're rushing through. So, um, you know, you have about an hour for each part. If you know that one section is going to take you longer than another, then you should budget for that. Um, but other than that, I don't think I missed anything. I'm just going to double check again. Um Yeah, it looks like that's it. Okay, so that's it. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to um, end my hangout. I'm going to post the archive video. I'm going to um, link it to the Constitution video. I would definitely check that out. Um, and if you're not certain about those Supreme Court cases or anything else, look at the video um, I post in Google Classroom. That document is time stamped. You don't have to watch like the whole like two hours or whatever. Like just go to the part of the video you need to. Okay, I'll see you in the morning.